Hello, and welcome to our afternoon conversations with artists about a work in A View From Here. Uh, today, I'll be joined by E.J. Hill, artist E.J. Hill will be joining me this afternoon to talk about his work in our exhibition, which is actually right behind me. <laughs> um, well, first, I just want to thank you. Let me just start off by saying that. So thank you so much for joining me this afternoon to have a conversation about your work in the, exhi in the exhibition view from here, uh, yeah. which is curated by Rita Gonzalez. Um, while the exhibition is closed um, to the public, we want an opportunity just to talk directly to artists about their work, um, not just about being in LACMA's collection, but about a very about having a very focused conversation about a, a particular work. So again, just thank you so much. Well, thank you. No, I'm excited to um, do this with you and honored uh, to be able to interface publicly. So as I mentioned, like I said, we'll, we'll mainly be focusing on um, this one work in the exhibition. Um, of course, if it touches on other works um, throughout your practice, we should definitely talk about them, but just so the audience has some context um, that'll really be much more of a focused conversation. So as people can see um, behind me, uh, the work um, is, you know, it's called um, Lesson Number Three. It was completed in 2020. And um, essentially it is a neon um, that has been affixed to a kind of more standard chalkboard. And so given the materials that you use to make the work, it feels only right to think about um, education and to think about your own um, relationship to education and your own experiences in school, um, especially growing up here in Los Angeles. So can you talk about your own relationship and then we'll kind of get into a deeper dive about why you chose to make this particular work. Yeah, um, well, I am born and raised here in LA. And so when, <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> But when I, I moved um, in 2015, uh, and I lived in New York for about a year uh, for the Studio Museum residency, and as I was moving back in 2016, I was really, you know, kind of reckoning with like, what um, what this place is, who am I in relation to Los Angeles, and just like thinking about home again, um, and that line of thinking got me spinning around um, how I've been formed and what things make me and my sense mm -hmm. of identity. and it immediately went to all the schools that I've attended here um, over the years. Uh, and, you know, thinking about like the ideas that are kind of, that like live in me, um, most, most of them I think come from, uh, yeah, just growing up, going to school. I spent more hours as a young person in school than I had outside of it. So I just kind of like thought about that as a, how, how people are formed. But in terms of you know your own experiences, I know that when you were a kid or more like elementary school, um, you went to a school predominantly with black and brown students, and then when you were you know kind of matriculating through the system, um, school system, then you went to um, you know predominantly Caucasian school, you know kind of like high school and, and beyond. So can you talk about that experience? I mean, kind of having. Um, you know, one type of experience in elementary school and getting a certain type of foundation and then being, I've heard you in, in other conversations kind of talk about the kind of jarring experience going from one type of environment to another and how that shaped your own kind of views about not only just what was being taught, but the educational system itself. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, growing up in South Central, like everyone around me um, was either black or brown, you know, and so everything from like school to, um, uh, all of the businesses, employees, like everything around home was, you know, black. And so I feel like it was, it wasn't anything that I had ever considered. It was just a given of my reality of my situation. But then I got older and, um, you know, this idea of like success or like you need to like go to the right school to get the right job, to like live the right life and all of these things when framed as, um, right or better or this like sort of aspirational move into whatever success means um i started to get you know signals from the world around me that better and improvement in, meant that i would have to distance myself further and further from the communities and people and neighborhoods that um, have formed me and that i've grown up in and so a lot of the years of my life i felt like i was sort of twisted and bent and comported and uh you know yielded to fit into situations or environments or institutions that weren't necessarily uh, formed or designed with me in mind or to, to like thrive or survive even. Um, 
And so I've spent so many years trying to be a particular type of person um, based on somebody else's rules. And so now that I'm like outside of school and have been out of school and formal institutions um, for like seven years now, um, I'm starting to get a sense of like who I want to be independent of like somebody else's teachings. And so, um, you know, there's this idea of like unlearning the things that um, we've, we've kind of learned over the years. And so now I feel like I'm maybe finally getting to test uh, who I am and want to be. Yeah. No, I, I, um, I read that in a press release about your work. Um, Savannah Wood had, had mentioned this idea of unlearning. And I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about what that process looks like for you. So I, I do want to mention that this is the third um, work in a larger series. So it's this process of, um, what, like I said, what does that process of unlearning look like? Um, and why did it feel like the right moment to do that, right? You had said that you had gone to New York, that you had an opportunity to kind of reflect on your, your time in LA, and also that you'd been out of school for, for seven years. But amongst the performance work and everything else, like why did it feel like this moment to, to unlearn? Um, um, I feel like, you know, my survival and the health and survival of um, those around me, my family, friends, my people, like depends on these unlearnings, you know? Like depends on a different type of uh, approach to like living and being in the world and existing in the bodies that we exist in. And I, I, you know, this being number three of a larger series, I imagine them as um, like, you know, like a, a 10 to 15 week quarter semester or something. So each one is a new lesson, new thing for, uh, you know, being, uh, lesson number one, right? We are not our pain. But imagine these sayings or these declarations as Something that I wish, um, you know, I, I would have been taught as a young person um, and con continued uh, learning as a young person. Lesson number two being twice as good is too much. You know, this idea that black people have to like go harder and faster and be twice as good to get yeah. you know, half as far. And so I'm, I kind of flipped that uh, to suggest like twice as good, it's, it's exhausting. And it's like breaking many of us down. And so I'm kind of taking all the things and I'm not actually sure if unlearning is a possibility at all. You know, I think it's oh. like romantic to think that the things that have been printed themselves when you deleted or face out, um, which is not the case because, you know, they get internalized and reformed, formatted, whatever. But um, I do think that it is possible to um, take those things that we've um, maybe inherited or um, consumed in some way or that has been like pressed up against us um, and kind of filter them through something else so that they come out on the other end, um, not in a destructive manner, but in a reparative manner. You mentioned, um, you know, the other uh, statements, um, we are not our pain and twice as good is too much. Um, and then this one, um, tenderness is our superpower. And they're at once declarative, but they're also vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about, like you could have taken so many different angles, you know, to reflecting on your own educational experiences, but also just education in general. And there's a bit of, which I think is in line with you as a person um, in terms of like, there's this, um, ability or there's, there's, there's this openness to being vulnerable. But I, I think what's, what strikes me, um, especially with this piece, um, is that the, the word tenderness does evoke a bit of, um, like I said, a bit, a bit of vulnerability. So you can talk about, I guess, your decision to go in that direction versus, you know, expressing hurt or frustration or anger or, you know, there's any number of things um, that, any other number of directions. Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious on, um, why you chose to go in that direction? I mean, you know, from as far back as I can remember, I've been so sensitive, <laughs> you know, like big old crybaby, like just young and feeling everything. So in like so much more, it seems, than the people around me, like feeling everything so intensely. And I could have, I can, I can't help it. It's just who I am. And I, I think, you know, growing up and even as an adult, um, uh, sensitivity is seen a lot of the time as like 
weakness, you know, um, if like you get a bruise and you're like bawling your eyes out. But um, I, I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel like it's something that I've been able to uh, hone and sharpen over the years as, um, as akin to like intuition and maybe being able to uh, develop an emotional intelligence that, that moves me through the world where I can maybe fall back a little bit in the times that I need to, understanding that, you know, there, um, there are times where, like, um, you know, where I'm getting it wrong, you know? And so if I'm thinking about, like, expanding a world and building a world where um, we can all be, you know, free and there is uh, no sort of, like, violent power structures that continue to get reinforced, I think part of that needs to come from, like, a really, like, deep feeling and, like, coming out of here and more into here. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not implying that that gives, like, everyone a free pass, but I'm, 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 I'm saying that if, if we're able to like learn and teach emotional intelligence with the same kind of vigor that we um, value the sort of like cerebral mind, um, I think, you know, I, I hope maybe this is a pipe dream as well, but um, I, I think that that might, um, uh, I don't know, start to open up things um, in a manner that's, um, uh, yeah, again, just, maybe more expensive for all for all beings. So how did you go about um, deciding, I guess, what statement to use? Um, and I also found it equally as powerful that you mentioned that these are things that you wish someone would have told you, you know, as you were kind of going through your own uh, or the other kind of education system. But how did you decide um, which statements to use? Are they a part of a larger poem or a song or are these just things that you've been thinking about? Um, yeah, I would love to learn more about the process of developing the work. Uh, I write pretty often. I, I, you know, have my sketchbook and it's, I, I think I process most, um, most often through language, through words before anything else. And so I try to start every morning with just like, you know, a casual free write over a cup of coffee. And so I like pull, um, uh, pull words and sentences and things that kind of resonate or that, um, that kind of, uh, you know, pulse in a way. Um, and, I'll, and they become like a, a sort of, um, uh, yeah, like a, an echo of a phrase in my head, or it's like that song that you can't get out of your head, like certain sentences just do that. Um, and not all of them make it into an artwork, but some of them are a little quieter that I maybe try to live by um, based on, yeah, just experiences. But that one seemed fitting. Tenderness is our superpower, it seemed fitting in the line of um, we are not our pain and um, twice as good as too much. And, you know, when I use like we and our- I was literally gonna ask you about that because you could have said my, yeah. right? So, you know, it's both inclusive in terms of using the word our, but then it's also aspirational, right? Mm -hmm. Because you were, you know, you were just saying how you want more people to be thinking both with their head and their heart versus just one or the other. Yeah. So I was just kind of curious about word choice. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, I'm very specific in, in who I'm imagining when I'm, when I'm saying we and our, you know, I, I speak from, uh, uh, I speak from black subjectivity, a queer subjectivity, um, but, you know, I want there to be room for the, the bodies that um, also, uh, that also, you know, could benefit from something um, from these words. Uh, an experience that's not mine, let's say like, you know, my um, trans and gender non-conforming brothers and sisters, um, uh, women, you know, differently abled, like these are the things that aren't, it's not the way I move through the world, but I definitely, if I'm going to be committed to doing this type of work, which I am, I want there to be room, even if I'm not um, living one specific experience, I know that there, there are overlaps in how we understand power, authority, and oppression. And mm -hmm. I'm not the expert on, 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 on all of these forms, of course. Um, so I speak from a particular lane, but I do want there to be enough for, um, uh, yeah, someone else who, who might need to be like, you know what, like, my softness is a power. And, and then finally, I guess, you know, not finally, but um, choosing neon is obviously a very intentional um, or working with neon is a very intentional way to work because it is so delicate, right? Like if, if you drop it, it will uh, shatter into a jillion different pieces. Um, 
So can you talk about, you know, why you decided to use neon versus, you know, any other chalk paint, anything else? Um, I think there is this um, sense that it stands out, um, but it's not screaming at you. You know, there, it, it is very, it's a powerful tool. So it's just kind of, and it's not the first time you've used neon. Um, you've used neon in, in several other uh, works, um, but I was just kind of curious on what's your attraction to neon generally, and then particularly for, for this work? Um, yeah, I actually, this, again, this started when I moved to New York. I had never lived there before. I didn't know very many people. And so to acquaint myself with the city, I would just walk around areas of Manhattan between the hours of like 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Just like walk around for hours and hours and hours. And a lot of the times, the only things that would like like they almost like serve as beacons because it's a very specific type of light. Yeah. Really charged, like literally and figuratively, but like it's it like I'm kind of like moth to a flame with neon. And so I found myself just like when I would see that glow, I would try and find it, just turn a corner and then stand in front of some closed um, dry cleaners or something and look at the like, you know, blue white collared shirt with the tie, like that dry cleaner neon. Um, and it would be so yeah. by that kind of light. Um, and then just started photographing them for like the first maybe month that I lived in New York. And it just became this, um, I don't know, kind of obsessed from there um it's it's a light that uh yeah just glows a little differently um and it's just like charged up noble gases it's it's amazing and so and this is your handwriting this is um that, got it and that was also very intentional uh to use your handwriting versus you know anything anything else did you consider um to, to, to kind of like you know give it a bit of distance from yourself did you consider using a more traditional font or you always knew that you wanted to have a bit more of a personal relationship think, to the work? Yeah, I think something about the hand, you know, because the text come like it comes from this, this writing practice, this like, you know, old school analog, like actual pen and paper, you know, like in the morning, like that feels like when I really want to remember something, I'll write it down on paper with pen. It feels like that's another way to get it, you know, actually right. in the body, in the mind, in the heart. Um, but uh, yeah, shout out uh, Dave Johnson, Leaf Cutter Studios for hooking up with the neon. <laughs> it's funny, I was going to shout out Studio Museum also, just, uh, you know, a little, <laughs> I know you already mentioned it, but of course we have, you know, we have to give a shout out. Um, and I was, you know, back to this idea of like, you know, of unlearning, because I think what was interesting about hearing your response was like both this process that you know you want and have to go through but there's also this recognition that you can never really quite do it um that some things have been like so ingrained in you that uh that you'll never quite unlearn them or that they've made you who you are today you know that there are some things that have actually benefited so it's, it's like i said i was just intrigued by your um attitude i guess towards this idea of unlearning that it's that there's this acceptance yeah um I mean, because you can't, I mean, you can't take away the things that have formed you, but you can maybe you, um, cultivate a deeper awareness of those things. And then so when new things enter, you know, your realm, when, when new things are kind of approaching being like, hey, like, I'm about to teach you something, you can kind of examine it in a way and say, like, is this something that I want or need in me? Or does this look like some of those other things that I feel like I need to shed and then we can be a little more deliberate in, in how we move. And so I think that, you know, as, as all being like works in progress, I feel like, um, yeah, now I'm getting to the point where I'm just like, yeah, maybe, maybe the unlearning for me at least isn't the move because um, I have tortured myself over the years trying to like extract all of these things, but now I'm sort of pivoting to be able, um, yeah, to maybe be a little more discerning in, in what I'm, yeah and what I'm allowing to um, how long these things stay you know and I, I definitely want to ask ask about um, you know this moment and uh, not to harp too much on education but you know because I'm um, the head of education and public programs here I'm, I'm thinking deeply as along with my team about um, this moment generally, but I also think obviously the impact that uh, the pandemic is having on kids and their ability to 
um, be together and learn and study and, and all these other things are coming to bear on the education system right now. But, you know, aside from that, I think, you know, just thinking about this moment generally, um, the pandemic, the racial reckoning, the earthquakes, the fires, I mean, it's like the passing of RB. I mean, it's literally like every single thing has happened. Um, one, you know, how has that impacted your creative process? Um, I know this is this particular work um, is the third like in a series and so have you thought about the next in the series and what that may look like um, so yeah I would just kind of you know want to check in about how this moment has encouraged you yeah. know frustrated you know where, where you are right now all of those things <laughs> Every <Same. single> one. <laughs> um, yeah I you know I, I have uh, as I'm, you know, again, seven years out of being like a, you know, formal student myself, I, I've been able to develop ideas around what I think, uh, you know, these spaces, if not all of them, I should be. I think all education should be free. I think all schools should be public. Like that's just a thing that, you know, I'm kind of uh, an idea I'm aligning myself with. Um, and so at this time in particular, I feel, you know, I'm, I'm things have slowed down, things have paused in a way, and I've been able to reflect um, so much in how I want to uh, continue or move through art and ideas. And, and it's, um, uh, you know, I think about somebody like Joseph Boys a lot, who, um, as an artist, uh, and, and the idea of like social sculpture, which, I, you know, is, I think, just like art, what art does, it goes out into the world and um, affects change like one way or the other. Um, and so as, as, as someone who, um, was thinking through alternative forms of education as well. Like I'm really excited about things like, you know, um, the black school in New York, um, uh, dark study, um, greetings from South Central, like these alternative educational initiatives that are popping up in this time and like gaining traction because I think people are really starting to realize that the, the, the ones like these like mega institutions who um, continue to, uh, you know, pump out like, I don't know, different versions of uh, legacy of yesteryear, like are, are kind of just like holding court as these like strong, yeah. and I'm, I think we're moving into something a little different, um, something that maybe like is actually um, uh, something that can like actually hold us, you know, um, rather than people like trying to fight to get into them to reinforce the same tired ideas. Not to, to put you on the spot, because I didn't necessarily tell you I was going to ask this beforehand, but I guess I'm now I'm curious on what would that alternative education look like in an art school context? Like, what are things, or what are, I don't want to say radical, but maybe different ways to think about art education that, because um, I know, you know, you and I have talked, or I've, and I've also heard you talk about your experiences in art school and coming out of art school and navigating the art world and all those kinds of things. So as we're in this moment of kind of radically rethinking and through the, some of the examples that you shared, what are some of the things that you would like to see done differently? Or what are some of the um, things you've seen out there that you think are really, the, or, the organizations themselves, I think you mentioned, but just like ideas themselves? Um, I think, you know, I, I one of, so I think it's twofold because at one point, I was like, burn it all down, let's start new, you know? <laughs> right. I'm like, well, like, all right, let's scale back a little bit. And like, maybe that's, that's an approach because I do think that some people, um, their work is really effective on the inside of these places. You know, some people um, are invited in and they, they do uh, some really important work. I think, um, I don't think that's necessarily for me right now, I'm kind of more of the like, <laughs> let's build the other things that um, provide actual alternatives um, to the to the stronger arms. Um, and but I think they need both. Like this is you know yeah. is um, we need some of us on the inside. We also need some of us on the outside um, uh, uh, watering the flower beds. And so I think what I'd like to see maybe on the inside is um, yeah, us in like higher positions, leadership positions, so that we know that the, the, the movement of the institutions um, are working in, in a direction that, uh, that is restorative and, and maybe allowing, um, uh, allowing students in particular, or learners rather, um, 
allowing space for them to have or to bring the type of knowledge that they already possess rather than being like, okay, now that you're here, I'm the expert and I'm going to tell you what you need to know and show you things right. that, you know, this idea of the, the canon, because I think when I, you know, came in, um, you know, going back to just like being a kid, uh, obsessing over TLC, like my childhood bedroom had like wall to wall, <laughs> Lord is posters of TLC. I love it. And, like, word up you know and so i feel like we, um <laughs> I, got to art I love school, it i'm with um, it when i got to art school and you know started um listening in on conversations around like you know feminism i felt like i couldn't participate in the way that everyone else was participating because i didn't know the language and i didn't know the references i didn't know the leaders and i felt like the knowledge that i held was insufficient but now, looking back at it, I could. I was like, well, I have references for this type of um, this type of information, like TLC in their baggy overalls, um, left eye with condom on our glasses, like sex positivity, like we're in charge of our sexuality, like all of these things can fit really radically within the space of uh, um, you know teachings on on intersectional feminism. And I feel like if though if there was someone in the room who was able to frame the conversation in that way and allow mm -hmm. all of our references to come to life to, to um, support the core ideas, I think I would have had a very different experience um, as I got older in school. Um, but I didn't have those, as, yeah. you know, and so I'm thinking the, the, the flip side of this is to like, get, you know, students who, like students already, learners come into the room already having a wealth of knowledge. And I think if, if the people who are, um, you know, running the show can um, honor that and acknowledge it and then make room for it, I think it could be a much better um, endeavor. I totally agree. Um, speaking of making room, I wanted to encourage anyone who may have a question um, for EJ to, uh, you know, to go to your the Q and A box and, and um, add any questions. Um, you know, we I obviously don't wanna hog the show. I know there are a lot of people out there uh, with questions. Um, so yeah, so if you have anything or you wanted to, to add anything to the conversation, uh, I am and my, you know, our, our LACMA team is monitoring the, the chat box in the background. Um, so I'll actually take one from the Studio Museum <laughs> first, uh, shout out to Eric, um, and really just talking about the role that empathy uh, plays in your work. Um, and then, you know, also kind of thinking about the gesture of, of writing, sculpture, and, and, and performance practice. So how empathy kind of uh, plays a role in all of the various ways um, that you work, that you work within. Um, yeah, I think empathy is tough because, you know, it is, it is something that I, I, I try to live by, you know, I'm trying to put myself in another's position to understand, um, you know, what they might be saying or going through or feeling. Um, I do think it is um, it is a, a a skill that can be um, refined, you know, always worked on. But um, you know, I'm the other side of me is just like if you if you haven't felt in your body the type of fear and anxiety that occurs when you are driving and see a car behind you. Like, I don't know if there's any way that you can just like explain that to someone and expect an empathetic response. Like my entire, my entire history of being a driver um, in Los Angeles or any other city, but particularly here because this is where I grew up, um, 80s, 90s kids, we're talking 1992 South Central Los Angeles. Like this is, this is the frame for my, my, um, my upbringing. When I see a cop behind me, my throat yeah. closes. You know, and there's there's yeah. there's nothing that you can do or say which would like guarantee an empathetic response from someone who does not know what that feels like. And so I'm I won't say that I'm like giving up on the idea of empathy, but I do think it's a little I'm wary of putting uh, too much light and focus on how empathy can be transformative because it can be, but there are certain things that. Um, if you have not lived it, you just will never understand. 
Amen to that. Um, <laughs> so we have um, also another question um, from Carol Aleel, a colleague here at LACMA, about um, the influence of music. Uh, she's obviously, you know, noticing behind you that you have a full band <laughs> uh, set up, <laughs> multiple guitars, um, you know, the whole works uh, behind you. So can you talk about, you know, the role that um, music plays um, in your life, your practice, uh, and how often you pick up those guitars uh, to play. Um, I actually, you know, I, when I made the decision to go to art school, um, music school was a contender and I knew, um, I didn't know anything about art. It wasn't something that I grew up with. It was at, at the suggestion of, you know, my first art mentor, um, Margaret Nomentana, who was like, I think you're an artist. And I was like, what? And so it just <laughs> was fun for me, just being like, what? Oh, weirdo child. <laughs> But music has always been the constant. And I, I, I decided to not go to music school because I was afraid that if I did, picking up my guitars from work would eventually kill my love of music. So I set it aside and protected it. And it was always the thing that I leaned on when I needed to get away from everything else. And so fast forward all these years and we're like shut in our homes um, and can't leave. Music has been the thing that has absolutely saved me. Um, because it's something that I know um, it feeds me in a way that, um, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, this might be a very unpopular thing to say, but it, it feeds me in a way that um, art hasn't. Like it gets to some, it gets to some core stuff when I'll like listen to one song for like 30 seconds that I've never heard before and it hits in that way and I'm listening to it on repeat for the entire day. Like there's something in... Yeah. I um, I want to be able to uh, access and honor, um, uh, yeah, for other people as well. But how does it? I, I you mentioned that it feeds you. It just it hits different, if if you will. But <laughs> but I mean like, <laughs> but I mean in terms of um, how do you find that it influences your practice, your art practice? Because you you talked about wanting to protect it and and on some level kind of keep it separate. But I'm just kind of curious on. Um, you know, how you find that it influences what you produce, what you make, what you're thinking about um, on the artistic side? It's, it's um, so on one level, it's kind of lyrical, you know, there's like language, it, language appears in the practice, like, you know, in the chalkboard and other neon works. And, and so I feel like I'm sort of doing this, like sing some stuff in my head and thinking about language almost as lyrics, but also in installations, I, I play around with titling in a very specific way. And so I think about, um, you know, every exhibition or every like, project that I um, present, the title of it will be some like long flowy thing. And then the works in the exhibition, I imagine as um, like a track listing, you know, I think about mm -hmm. this education of Lauren Hill as the greatest album of all time. Um, and so if I think about the show titles as like, the miseducation, um, but then like there's a painting that's like lost ones, or there's a neon that's like tell him or something, you know. And so they 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 come they come together to make up the whole. So I'm thinking of I'm thinking of things like very musically um, often. And does literature and poetry play that same role? Um, not not the same way. No, um, it's I mean I feel like yeah, music is. Uh, I mean, of course they, you know, they, they yeah. sound, but um, uh, literature and poetry are, are kind of like the, they're like the bonus tracks, you know? <laughs> like, they're the hidden tracks that you have to wait that full 47 seconds of silence on the, like, CD to hear. I cannot, did you say CD? I can't, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry, I just had a moment where you just said CD. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I was just curious because, you know, as you mentioned, not only are your titles long, but there's a, you know, a poetic nature to them. And also both with, you know, these statements as well, that there's, uh, they are poetic. And so just kind of, you know, asking and, and also kind of chiming in from a question from the audience about, um, you know, what role poetry or literature uh, plays. Um, and if, if they occupy the same space as music. Um, and then, um, you know, of course, I think we have to ask about uh, your relationship to LACMA. Um, don't worry, this is not a plug for you to say how amazing LACMA is. 
No, I'm kidding. But um, it's just to say that, uh, you know, you being from LA, you know, growing up here um, and now having, you know, a work in the collection, um, you know, just wanted to ask about, you know, did you, when you were growing up, did you come here? Um, did you, you know, what does it feel like to now have a work in the collection, kind of being in your hometown? Just wanted to ask about, I guess, your relationship to the museum. And again, don't worry, no one, <laughs> nothing's going to happen if you say you never came here and you hate life. Martha. So um, don't, don't say that, but <laughs> hold up. it'll just like cut off. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, I know, I, shh, like, I just, but, <laughs> I can't hear you. I actually, um, I, I hadn't been to LACMA ever until I moved back to LA for grad school. And so I had known, you know, of the La Brea Tar Pits. Like I came, and so when I went to LACMA, I was like, oh, it's right next to there. And I was like, I did, was this always here? Is this a new thing? And so when I look back at my younger years, art was so far from the realm of like anything that I knew. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, I, I do wonder if that was just a condition of like my particular experience as like a first generation American, you know, like immigrant family from Belize. Like, is this like, I, I was like, I don't have, I don't know what the absence of like art in this way for my life is attributed to. Um, but I do know that there's like an entire, most of my life existed um, without museums and galleries and like fine art. You know, like it wasn't like, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. <laughs> and so to be in the collection now in this like short, you know, short span, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. I do feel, um, I feel that there's this, this maybe like link that I can draw between something that is so um, uh, celebrated within my own hometown for my family and friends and younger people who also might not know that like yeah. my black life exists. Like I, I feel like um, part of the work is also being like, like, yo, did you know that like art is a thing? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> you want, want to look at some art or something? I don't know. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that that, you know, is certainly, um, you know, something that's something important to think about where, you know, you can live in a city, you know, as, as big and as sprawling as LA and never um, feel comfortable in or have a desire to go to or be brought to uh, a museum like LACMA. And I, I definitely think that that's the core of our mission here, you know, both in terms of me personally and our department is to really think about how we can um, bring more audiences in and, but then also bring art to them and not make it feel as if you have to come to LACMA to experience art or to make art or to have a connection to art. Um, but, you know, I think that it's, it's certainly, um, you're certainly not alone, I think, in that experience of, you know, not having, you know, had more of a formal kind of fine art experience until much later in life, because mm -hmm. there is this like, what do I do? What am I looking at? What do I say? You know, all, and, and, you know, just not having a relationship. And so I know, again, I think for me personally, is thinking about how do we break down those barriers and how do we bring more people in and make them feel like this is their space? Yeah. Um, so. I mean, long haul, I think, you know? Yeah. But I feel like this is, maybe this is a small part of that as well. And I think, you know, this, you know, this moment, um, and, and you and I have talked about this um, as well, where it's, it's both, it, it's a crazy moment. 2020 has been crazy for a lot of reasons, um, but we're also in the midst of, um, you know, this, this racial reckoning and this real, um, I don't want to say confrontation, but just, um, there's a lot of conversations happening about Black Lives Matter, about um, Black joy, Black death, Black people mattering. I mean, all these kinds of, kinds of things. And so, um, you know, one of the questions that we've gotten from the audience is, you know, what do you see, or you know, how do you see your work kind of operating in this moment? Um, do you think it has a social impact? Do you think um, that, uh, and I think it does. Like I said, I think positive idea of tenderness and I think a feeling and emotion is a much very, is a very different way, I think, of thinking about um, how to kind of deal with this moment. But I was just kind of 
again, kind of thinking about um, a question from the audience about the, the social impact of work like yours, um, and what role do you think it plays? Um, yeah, I've, I've been influenced by artists and artworks that, um, that do press against the edges of um, what is standard or acceptable um, or common practice. And that's always been an approach that's really um, excited me um, and, and modeled for me what's possible and how to, um, not in any sort of like unrealistic way, but like how to actually change the world. Um, even if very, very slightly, um, or change one person's world, which, you know, is, is major. Uh, so I, I try not to like get too in my head about like everything that I make being something that um, yeah. parallel to that, because if I did, I would be paralyzed. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I would hope that the ideas within that, the ideas that, um, are foundational to the work um, can be traded and transferred in ways that like do bounce against things that are accepted as standard. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, at this time, it's this time has been a little difficult for me, I'll be honest, because I don't, I feel really rinsed out. Like every single yeah. day I wake up and I'm just kind of like, okay, like I have to do the like, you know, Jessica's pep talk in the mirror, like, <laughs> you know, the little girl on the counter. Um, but I, I feel like I have to, uh, yeah, I have to build, I have to build some thick skin somewhere. Like it can't all yeah. be like raw, exposed um, tenderness because I, I don't think I would actually survive what the world asks me to endure. Um, so, I think at this time, part of part of what I've been doing is like pulling way back, scaling back um, how present I am, like out there, um, how vocal I am, because it takes it takes a lot out of me. And so, doing something like this, you know, is um, is wonderful. I'm, uh, you know, again, glad and honored to be able to do this with you. Um, but I was joking with a friend that like after this, like I'm like. I'm going I'm moving to the mountains, joining the monastery for like six months, you know, um, and just kind of pull them back. Yeah, no. Recharge. I mean, I know, of course, some people don't have the option to um, tuck away and hide in a cave and that there is this like constant assault on the like senses and psyche and the heart. Um, and so I do acknowledge that there's, there's a certain amount of privilege in being able to like step away uh, and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of myself in these ways, because if I don't, um, it, it yeah, might have like really severe effects. I mean, I completely agree. I mean, I think, yes, we're, I'm sure we're both seeing on, you know, social media where um, there is this general level of exhaustion, you know, and, and fatigue and this feeling of, you know, just, just even the last six months, right? We've had the killing of George Floyd. I mean, it's all these one after another after another and then it's not only just the news but it's also seeing you know the video footage and then with Brianna Taylor you know it's just this exo on one level you're um sadly you know not surprised anymore by um you know the, the verdicts in some of these cases or the fact that they're you know police officers not being held accountable and yet you're still extremely exhausted um by and and sad and angry at what's happening. So, you know, it's, I think it's incredibly brave of you to acknowledge that there is this, um, this desire to kind of pull back and, and this desire to, to, to privilege self-care um, right now, because we are in a moment where there's so much literally uh, being asked of us, both like kind of mentally and on a physical level. Um, so. Yeah, because I, you know, like I said earlier, I live this, this is my reality. Like this like lethal threat is something that I've like grown up with. And so, you know, add that lethal threat to like the global, you know, this pandemic one, like I'm, I feel like, I feel really pressed these days. You know, I don't, I'm, I don't necessarily need to scroll through and look at all of the ways that we as, um, you know, black people specifically being, um, pressed into like every corner and into the ground like I 
that's that's not new for me you know so i'm, I'm yeah I'm a little, like less inclined to um consume those visuals you know um this time has been this time has been super difficult um yeah uh, so i didn't mean to take it to a, <laughs> a completely because <laughs> we are you know <laughs> um but just to say that, again, I think that you know, acknowledging and um, us, I think, openly talking about that that vulnerability and that exhaustion, I think, is necessary because I think it doesn't happen often enough. Um, where you know, we, we talk about what um, the toll I think that all of this um, kind of takes on on black bodies um, in particular. But um, you know, I we've gotten through a number of um, uh, the questions, but I, I just I definitely want to end with. Uh, uh, actually a question from my, my colleague in the department. What are you reading? What are you listening to? What are you reading? Um, I know you like, you know, Lauren Hill's album, which I agree, we need to stick some prints in there. But, you know, like what, um, what are you reading? What are you listening to? Uh, what brings you joy? Uh, yeah. What brings me joy? I'm like, I feel like it's all, it's I'm like looking around. I'm, it's all kind of like pulsing in there. I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that I've been, oh God, what am I listening to? That's always a hard question. It's like, what are you consuming, you know, in life? Yeah. Um, I don't, what am I reading? I'm flipping through a lot of stuff. Like right now, um, uh, next to my, my bed is a book. Um, I think it's like notes on a nervous, on a nervous planet. I mean, it is all about like how social media is like, you know, making us all. Oh. Like, freaked <laughs> out. Um, so I'm like kind of flipping through that. Um, uh, and then Caitlin uh, Greenwich, uh, we love you, Charlie Freeman. I'm like starting to slowly pick my way through that. So there's like things. Um, the last yeah. um, uh, uh, I don't know, album that I've been like, it's always just like, uh, I don't know, not for <laughs> um, I, I I'm looking at this, um, this chat. I, there's this question um that i do want to um talk about in 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 terms of like uh love um which is also which is i feel one note sometimes when talking about this um but safira patel asks um how do i understand the process of unlearning as romantic romanticized pursuit um and i remember the first time that we met um when you yes. came to the studio visit i had um like just gotten like the heart broken into a million That's, yes <laughs> i remember that meeting you as like a studio museum curator and me being like oh my god like what am i going to show like what, like what art am i going to talk about and you came in and i was like he broke my heart <laughs> <laughs> really funny because i feel like so much of what i um like do and think about um is in the space of just like being better in life and in love receiving and giving it and just like this I think that's where this this idea of like tenderness comes from because I do think of love as this like um this like life practice and it's not always like a romantic um love you know it's a type of familial love the friend friend love the love that you know you have for your neighborhood the, the love that you have for the planet like all of these forms of um and I think maybe in terms of love um we can talk about uh um care you know what does it yeah. look like to care for oneself for another and okay maybe on what i'm reading this sometimes is teaching to transgress bell hooks they, i keep this really close always yes. just because it, um, she writes about love a lot as well and so um it's i don't know um i mean we're talking about the miseducation of lauren hill as i think one of the things <laughs> of all time i agree we can't talk about that and not talk about love you know Oh my God, my mom's in the chat. Yes, your mom's. I was literally about to shout out your mom. So as a way to, so your mom wants me to put you on the spot <laughs> and ask you to play something on your guitar. So, so it, it, only because it's your mom. That I, <laughs> that's literally, she, she chimed in like, this is EJ's mom. Like she pulled rank. I and basically was say no to my mom when she's like, Hey son, do your thing, you know? <laughs> yes. So, so I think maybe as a way as like an outro, if you will. That's so funny. She got me. <laughs> she 
she did. She, your mom really called you all the way out and is asking you to play something. So okay. do it only if you want to. But I, I think uh, before you grab your guitar, I just want to say thank you um, thank you. for you know jumping on Zoom with me and and chatting about this work. But just you know just chatting about what you're thinking about and what you know is not just again inform this work, but just your practice generally. So thank you, EJ. And uh, like I said, I know the museum is not open, but um, you get a little sneak, like I wanna move my hair out of the way, a little uh, sneak peek of EJ's work in the exhibition, in, in exhibition View From Here, uh, curated by my colleague and friend, Rita Gonzalez. And uh, when the museum opens, I hope everyone will come out and see the exhibition. So on that note, take it away, EJ. <laughs> this is what- Connie's asking me to turn on original sound for the music. What is original sound? <laughs> I know, right? Okay, good. You're, I was like, are you wearing pants? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm at home. I'm comfortable. I'm with it. hundred. I mean, me too. <laughs> um, because... It's in tune enough. <laughs> but it finally has. A good old, a good old love song. Um, Let's do it. From uh, James Morrison. It's been a while. I might, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> there was a time I had nothing to give. And I needed shelter from the storm I was in. Then it all got too heavy. As time slipped away, I could stay here forever. Hold you this way Cause you You all that I need For you I give my soul to keep Cause you see me Love me just the way I am. I said for you, I am a better man. I said you are reason for everything that I do. I belong so lost without you. Thank you so much, EJ. <laughs> I was I know your mom put you on the spot, but that was that was very special. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And please do not hide in a <laughs> um to run off to the mountains after this conversation. Um and uh, again. Thank you, and uh, thank you for joining us out there uh, in the <laughs> on the internets. And uh, we'll be back with another conversation, I think, next week. But please check our um, check our website for uh, another conversation about a view from here. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, y'all. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>